backpack Food and friends, but Canada's best From east to west, there and back Eat North Variety Pack Cause variety's the spice of life Hello and welcome to another episode of Eat North Variety Pack. I am still here stuck in my home, uh, joined virtually by Marilyn Smith in Toronto and Carmen Chang in Calgary. How are you two doing today? Good, how are you? You know, I'm good. I was just saying before we went on, I'm, I'm happy that it is getting to be sunny or warmer outside, although today is a bit cloudy here, but it's still, it definitely changes your disposition, I think. Absolutely. I walked my dog earlier, didn't even have to wear a jacket. It was really nice. Living the dream, right? <laughs> and now I like it. I like it when it's raining here, which it is today in Toronto, because when I go out for my walk, I don't have to worry about social distancing because mm -hmm. I'm the only idiot out there. Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it is it is interesting now to see how many people are out and about because it is warmer. So when I go cycling along by the river here in Calgary, some portions of it, I do feel quite uncomfortable actually cycling there. So I've sort of changed my route now. But it's interesting how we've gotten so used to not being around people that when we are now faced with being around even just a small group of people, it doesn't, it feels a little bit strange. It's so true. It does. You know, for me, I feel like I'm, I play secret agent and I'm serpentining down the street, mm -hmm. you know, trying to avoid people. Like, mm -hmm. So when I say, you know, walk in the rain or my, my husband and I, we go out at night and we call it the fart walk and we go out and we walk in the dark and, uh, and yeah, because, you know, we eat a lot of beans. But anyway, um, but there's <laughs> no one out in the street and it's just wonderful. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I think with the, with the weather, again, it's going to be nice here in Toronto on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be serpentining uh, all over the place. What about you guys? What do you think about that? Um, I I feel like with the weather that's warmer, I definitely have seen a lot more people out for sure. I think I've gotten used to the fact that it's not really rude crossing the street when someone's coming towards you and like dodging them. Mm -hmm. um, I still let my dog sniff other dogs, but I'm like, you know, far away, right? Uh, from the other owner. But uh, no, I'm seeing more people out. I feel like people have gotten a bit complacent though. And even in grocery stores, standing closer mm -hmm. or going down, you know, the aisles in both ways. And I don't know, I don't know if you two have noticed the same. I do think it's been a while now, and yeah, I, I think when it, those sort of restrictions or their, I guess, uh, I don't know what the word is, I can't think of the word today, but I, I, when when the grocery stores put through the suggestions to walk through the aisles, you know, uh, one way in, one way out, I think that worked really well for the first week, but I agree with you now, when I do pop into the grocery store, I notice that a lot of people just don't even pay attention anymore. Mm -hmm. It's also hard to police, though, too. I think as a grocery store, they're dealing with so much already. How do you even police or control that kind of situation, right? Sort of left up to us as a grocery shopper. But, yeah. Um, did you watch Top Chef Canada this week? I know, Carmen, you're a fan. I did, and yes. I... I know you did, Dan. Yes. I know that you had the taping of this last episode. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk too much about it, but I was actually at the taping for this third episode of the show, which was done in October of last year, so it's quite quite... A long time ago now yeah. but I was so oh. excited for this episode because I had one of the best things I've ever tasted in my life and it was this absolutely phenomenal brownie yeah and, it looked amazing oh, it's incredible it's uh, Montreal caterer Joe Notkin she made this beautiful brownie I'm gonna show a picture here because it is that beautiful so I'm gonna, yes. there we go. you Gorgeous. posted that oh. you you bad man you posted that because now it's like what the heck was that? That is not a brownie. That is sex on brownies. It's like a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> right? It's to totally next that level. Regular brownie. That is like, sign me up. No, well, I, it was you know aptly named too, right? Because didn't she name it the Jewel Box Brownie? And yeah. when it was shown on um, television, like it looks like a Jewel Box with oh. all the different like dried fruits oh, and stunning. so gorgeous. And even when you posted that, it's one of the best things you've eaten, like had to get on it. So absolutely, it's so, for your, your order with me and I can't wait to try it when it comes because she's shipping across yeah, she, Canada. It's she is awesome. a smart uh, cookie, what? sort of kind of a pun intended there. Uh, yeah, so now she is shipping these Jewel Box Brownie kits all across Canada. So as soon as I saw that, I, I grouped up some friends and we ordered six. So we have six on the way, like six boxes of brownies <laughs> coming to Calgary. So 
I'd probably eat those quite quickly, I think, but we'll yeah. see. And what I'm loving about this season, I don't know if um, it was that way when you were at the taping and trying mm-hmm. the different foods in person, it seems like there's a lot of female chefs that are really thriving. Mm-hmm. A lot of female chefs that are, seem to be doing really well. And mm-hmm. that's kind of our theme for this episode, too. We have some amazing, like, female performers and business folks and authors and chefs that uh, I'm excited to chat with. I, I 100% agree. I think that this is going to be a really fun show. You know, we have some amazing people. Uh, Arlene Dickinson, first and foremost, we do have her here with us today. So maybe I'll bring her on right now to say hello if you're ready for a chat. Yes. Um, awesome. All right, welcome. Oh, I have Arlene's name tag on me, so I'll just move it over there. Okay, <laughs> perfect. I am not Arlene. Yeah, there we you go. You can be me. <laughs> Hi, Arlene. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for chatting with us. I know you're very busy and we, we appreciate your time. Um, how have things been for you during this pandemic and the time of social distancing? You know, it's been interesting. I've been um, isolated for the last six weeks. I've been in my home in Calgary mm-hmm. here. And it's been, I'm a bit of an introvert. I tell people this all the time. So I'm not really that fussed by being alone. So it hasn't really impacted me that much in that matter. But I am starting to... You know, I, I do go for walks. I'm trying to figure out how to make sure I'm outside more now. I'm I'm kind of at my the end of feeling like okay, I can handle this mm-hmm. by myself now. I actually am craving to you know see people and go to restaurants and do things. But you know, we're gonna do the right thing and stay home uh, as long as they tell us we need to. Absolutely, uh, things vary drastically from province to province to province with with restrictions. It's really hard to keep up. But I found out that on this coming Monday, on May fourth, restaurants in Manitoba will actually be allowed to have their patios open for regular sit down service only to a max of ten guests. But that's still, in terms of Canada, it's quite progressive. I think. So when do you think we'll see that kind of thing maybe start to happen again in Alberta? I mean, I don't think we're going to see it for a few weeks. I I don't. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm certainly not a health expert, mm-hmm. but I, everything I'm hearing, it seems like it's going to be the end of May before we really get to a place where we're starting to open things up a little bit more. But, you know, I don't I, I just hope they only do it when they're ready to do it and mm-hmm. when everything's a little bit more under control. So whenever that is, we just have to accept it. But let's hope it's uh, still in May. And if it slips into June, then that's when it's going to slip into. But I'm hoping May. Yeah, let's cross our fingers. <laughs> So uh, you deal with so many small businesses through District Ventures, uh, especially the Accelerator Program, which works with small businesses to help them find success. Uh, What are you hearing from small business owners about their struggles with uh, fixed costs or uh, rent agreements? Because the rent relief came out, although it's not a perfect, uh, not a perfect plan. So I'd be interested to hear your take on that. It's really hard for businesses, you know, these small businesses, especially early stage growth businesses that were just starting to take, you know, get traction Mm -hmm. and just getting listings in stores and just starting to build their businesses. I think they're very vulnerable right now. So if they don't have a listing, it's hard for them to now get a listing, uh, a new listing. Um, Inventory management, understanding, you know, some some of our companies are doing incredibly well because they happen to be in the area of food space that is most in demand. So Mm -hmm. pastas and, you know, um, pancake mixes and you know, things like that. So flourish pancake mix and chickpea pasta. I mean, high demand for those types of businesses. But in general, these 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 uh, entrepreneurs are under a lot of stress and a lot of strain, and they're all just trying to survive. They don't have a lot of employees. They they're trying to just carry on business and hopefully these rent reliefs and the things that the programs that the government are putting in place is going to help and, and keep them um, afloat until they get through the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And Carmen, you, you have a lot of uh, peers and, and colleagues in the restaurant industry. So do you, is there anything you want to ask in regards to that specifically? Yeah, it's actually it's opportune time to have you on this um, on the show because I have had several conversations with folks lately and just wondering what your top two pieces of advice would be to folks who are small business owners or uh, people who are looking to start businesses during this time or with the upcoming outlook. You know, I'm in, in particular because I focus on the food and health and the consumer goods space. Um, we're telling people to make sure they're preserving capital, but not to turtle and not to hibernate because you have to. This is a time to actually, you know, try and 
think about your business and how can you ensure that your product is getting out there. So I think the um, instinct is to just do nothing and just see it out, but that actually doesn't help you. So, you know, make sure you're not um, being foolish with your capital, but also make sure you're thinking hard about the things you are doing and are they being effective. And so I'd say, you know, make sure your, digi your digital experience is strong. Make sure you're doing a really good job of, you know, e-commerce because that's where people are turning right now. And then make sure you're not stopping all that activity with the hopes that it's just going to pick up exactly mm -hmm. as it was right after this is over. You have to continue to try and keep your business going. Mm -hmm. So Arlie, you bring up a really good point about not turtling. I think that it really applies in our personal lives too. I, I see a lot of people like going, oh, what, what the heck with my health? What the heck with everything? I'll just eat junk and you know drink wine all day. So um, hey, is there something um, wrong with I, that? I liked your idea. You're, no, you're being proactive and taking care of business. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you're exactly right. What we do, you know, we all joke about our, you know, the the COVID diet, you mm -hmm. know, like whatever, which is not a diet. It's just eating whatever is bad for you. I think right now, but I honestly, I think we have to just uh, our mental state is so. Uh, reliant on the food we consume and there's such a direct correlation between what we eat and how we feel and particularly now when we're already down and we're already kind of have a lot of fear and anxiety because of what's happening um, I think it's incredibly important for us to make sure we're eating well and taking care of ourselves and trying to exercise as much as we can and you know what that all sounds great and sometimes you just want to pull the you know the covers over your head and stay in bed and eat cream puffs and that's okay too like <laughs> I, 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 I just don't think we can judge. We're all dealing with this in our own ways, and we're all doing the best we can. And I, but, but eating, eating well does matter. Absolutely. So do you, think you said about you know you do your best because I think this is very much like grief. Like everybody grieves differently, and so we're going to cope with COVID differently. But I, I love your proactive uh, approach. Yeah. So. Yes, I'm with you. We're in the same. We're on the same page. Yeah. Sorry, Dan. I keep cutting you off. No, no, Carmen. I think I'm cutting you off. So that's the uh, magic that's okay. of. Okay, Arlene. I was just wondering. Do you think that COVID is presenting an opportunity then for other businesses or industries to maybe thrive or products? Yeah, I mean, for sure, you know, you you never want to think of yourself as being opportunistic around a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but in some respects, you know, there are businesses that are going to do much better through this and they need to make sure that they're delivering. And I, like, I'm very proud of the companies we've invested mm -hmm. in at, through District Ventures because these companies, as I said, are in the food and health space. Mm -hmm. And so what matters more right now than the, exactly what we're talking about, what you're consuming, are they the things good for you? Is your health taken care of? Are you taking the right vitamins are you doing the right things so uh, yeah these businesses are doing well through this um, and the real trick of the businesses is it going to continue to do well after mm -hmm. this is over because it is going to end and you've got to build a business that's sustainable for the long run and I think especially when we look to the food and drink sector if you are a sit-down establishment or even takeout or to go I feel like there the new normal is not going to be what normal was mm -hmm. a year ago so I think it'll be interesting to see how restaurateurs specifically pivot into this new world right. of you know less probably less people in their spaces and more strict protocols with the, yeah against table spacing and things like that many of them are pivoting and, and doing you know um the food that they're delivering out the back door is actually as important what is actually now the revenue that they're getting you know? also yes. the delivery the things that they're doing in terms of the baking that they're doing and the delivery and the ready meal kits that they're creating and so i think there's this uh there's just a different economy and we just have to make sure that we're ready to meet the needs of consumers i mean i don't know about you guys but i'm i'm buying so much of my well i'm buying everything online right now who's mm -hmm. not buying everything online so they say that's 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 what everyone's doing. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I, I see that as the I evolution. Have a absolutely. Question. I have a burning question. Okay, so Arlene, when you when you make decisions about who you're going to uh, back, do, do you come from a place of um, like a gut instinct? Is it a pros and con? Is it a is it a totally a financial? I mean, how or is it a kind of a combination of all of those things as being a woman making a decision? Uh, listen, I, I learned, somebody told me years ago that instinct, you know, the feeling you have in your gut is actually that you have brain cells in your stomach. And so when you have that gut feel, you actually are using your intelligence as well as this, you know, intuition is actually founded in, in um, a mechanism using brain cells. So I'm, 
I do believe in using my gut instinct. At the same time, I'm very practical about it. I think about, do I like the idea? Do I think the product has opportunity? And then I, and then where it becomes much more intuitive is, do I believe in this entrepreneur? Do I think they have what it takes to really be successful and to break through and to, to take this product to the next level? And that's where you, you can't, you know, you only spend a certain amount of time with somebody before you invest in them. So there's a lot of, you can look at numbers all you want. You can try taste products product all you want you can look at the market all you want but at the end of the day if the entrepreneur doesn't know what they're doing and can't like that doesn't have the tenacity and persistence then you, you fail so I'm a big believer in doing that gut check is this somebody I trust and like and want to work with and believe is going to have what it takes on a similar note can you think back you know you've been on Dragon's Den for years now, uh, District Ventures has helped so many small businesses. Is there one food and drink business in particular that you think was truly unique and has really exploded un under under your guidance? Uh, you know, I've had we've had a lot of really great success stories. I mean, I named a, a, a couple. You know, like uh, we have a meal kit company in Montreal that we've invested in called Cook It, which is doing mm -hmm. significant business because they're delivering really good, healthy food to people's homes, which is what we all want right mm -hmm. now. Um, Flourish Pancakes, which is a high protein pancake mix. So, you know, people cooking for their kids, but still want to deliver great protein and, you know, ability to give them something good. Chickpea pasta has done phenomenal with a two ingredient chickpea and lentil pasta, high protein, you know, really, really great. Um, Prairie fava, which is a fava bean flour. I could, I could like, honestly, I could go on and on. Bow Valley barbecue, a, a local Canmore, um, chef who created an amazing line of barbecue sauces and salad dressings called Boccalino salad dressings and uh, barbecue sauces under the Bow Valley barbecue and salsa brand. He wins awards all over the world. It's a fantastic product. I mean, these are companies that are just from all over, all over Canada, the ones I just listed and some great local ones as well. And it's really rewarding. It's fantastic to watch them grow. I'm, 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 I feel like I've got like a hundred kids right now. I'm so excited <laughs> about them all. You know, like every one of them, I'm like, yay, cool. You know? And then sometimes you're going, no, that was a bad thing. You yeah. shouldn't have done that. Yeah. But it's I would definitely be that passion. kid for sure. Yeah. Yes. And it's amazing to see the passion you have for these businesses. And I, I come from an HR background. So I love what you say about it's not always just the what you're making and producing because that's important too and there needs to be a market for it but it's about the how you're doing it and you mentioned tenacity certainly we've talked about the ability to pivot um any other is there like one or two more competencies from a behavioral standpoint do you think really gets that business person to be successful yeah i mean certainly um there probably the other thing is social you know social cause make sure that there's something baked into your business model that allows you to give back in some way to the community or to the things and the causes you care about and the, the companies i've just listed all do exactly that and it's not something they think about after the fact they've started off doing that so they either become b corps or they you know they give in their own way and then i think the other thing is uh, really pay close attention to your talent. Because sometimes when you're a small business owner, you're so glad that anybody will work for you. Like, <laughs> oh my God, you'll come to work for me? Like, yeah, that's the best. But then you realize, oh, maybe they aren't the best person for the job. And then it becomes really hard because you become friends with them and you know, you're know you now going, oh, the business has grown and they haven't. So I think choosing who you have as your team is a critical thing mm -hmm. and don't give away equity to the first person that comes wants to come work for you mm -hmm. because that's another mistake everybody makes like hold on to your equity and um, you know at, at some point you'll reward the right people mm -hmm. Absolutely. well I, th I think we could all probably talk to you Arlene for another hour two days whatever so I think but I think we, we've kept you long enough so I'm gonna let you go but thank you so much for the amazing conversation and insight it's it's really an honor to have you on this really thank you is. so much uh, it's my pleasure thanks for what you're doing to promote the food scene and, and in locally and across the country and for everything you're doing uh, I love the little jingle at the front so yeah. <laughs> thanks for everything you guys are doing awesome. okay bye-bye 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 bye-bye
Who doesn't love Arlene Dickinson? Just fantastic oh, conversation. And oh, come on. Did so I fan girl? I was like, trying so hard not to fan girl. <laughs> uh, she's, she's so fantastic. And I, I love how active she is on social media as well. She's especially on Twitter. She's putting out so many messages of positivity and encouragement, especially during. She was doing it long before the pandemic. But now I just feel like there's just so much more value in that kind of messaging, especially from someone in, in her kind of position. I feel like it goes a long way. Yeah, I've always appreciated her Twitter because she balances that support and also challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, she's not afraid to challenge when things aren't right or when the integrity doesn't seem to be there, either governmentally or even within our city or with businesses. Mm -hmm. I've always appreciated her voice. Yeah, no, fantastic. So in a somewhat similar vein, I'm going to bring on Jen Sharp, who is a, a real innovator in the uh, food media scene, but also in the agricultural sector. So she's a lot of interesting things going on, including a brand new book that just came out two days ago called Flat Out Delicious, your definitive mm -hmm. guide to Saskatchewan food artisans. I think I got that right. Food artisans of Saskatchewan. Anyway, uh, I'm going to give Marilyn a break here and uh, okay. Carmen so and I are going to bring... Sorry? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm disappearing and I'll watch. Yes, okay. and we're going to bring Jen Sharp on. <laughs> Hello, Jen. Hi, Jen. <laughs> How, How are, are you? you? How's it going? Oh, it's so warm in Saskatoon. I'm excited because my dress still fits after the, the COVID <laughs> eating that Arlene was talking about. <laughs> So it's a pretty magical week for you, I guess. It's magical. Mm -hmm. And my book baby was born. So yes. it's, yeah, it's really magical. <laughs> I have it back here somewhere. I should have brought it up. It's summer. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. Do you want to just talk a little bit about it? Flat Out Delicious? Oh, it's right there. Yay. There we go. <laughs> so it's a little bit of everything, this book. And on the outset, it's a, it's a travel log. It's mm -hmm. meant to inspire and help you plan journeys all over Saskatchewan to meet our food artisans. So that's small scale farmers, chefs, beekeepers, everybody, you name it. And combined with that, it's also a bit of a call. Well, not a bit. It is a call to action mm -hmm. to get back to our roots, get back to basic mm -hmm. and grow thriving local food systems uh, by supporting these food artisans. And like Arlene was saying, too, this is the best time to do it. Like this healthy food uh, mm -hmm. diets that are, are centered around locally produced food that have high nutrient values, all those kinds of things. That's it's great for our mental health, our physical health, our local economy, and like I could go on and on about the benefits. So <laughs> flat out delicious is a, a little bit of everything. <laughs> so Jen, I've had a chance to go to Saskatchewan and uh, eat with you and dine with you and chat about the food scene. What are some of the mi common like misperceptions about the food scene in Saskatchewan? Yeah, you know, I think the those misconceptions go along with misconceptions about Saskatchewan as a whole. And I, I make a bit of fun about it in the book, and I say, like, we're, we're, we're anything but flat-out boring. Mm -hmm. But I mean, <laughs> when, <laughs> when you talk to people about Saskatchewan, and I mean, I've met people all over Canada that are always, they always have the same thing to say. It's just like, oh, we just drive through or we fly over it, and we just get forgotten. But then when people come here, like you have, Carmen, yes. uh, they realize how vibrant and authentic yes. and inspiring our, yes, it is small, like our culinary scene compared to other centers, like in Saskatoon and Regina, but how much our chefs are innovating. And yeah, that just that down home prairie hospitality combined with really incredible food. And I think the same can be said for our value added food producers mm -hmm. and our small scale farmers as well. So it's just, it's a really a yeah, I would say. One thing that I really love about Saskatchewan, and I, I was born and raised in Saskatoon, is I don't think, even when I was younger, I don't think I fully understood how many ingredients come from Saskatchewan. Yeah. So even, mm -hmm. even when I'm traveling, lentils is the most obvious example, but even when I'm traveling around the world, I will pick up a bag of lentils. It doesn't matter where I am in like Taiwan mm -hmm. or Czech Republic or um, Spain, and there'll always be from Saskatchewan. So mm -hmm. I just don't, I think people will take for granted, like, yes, it is flat and you can technically see a dog run away for quite <laughs> a far distance, <laughs> but, but those flat areas are full of so many ingredients that we should be really proud of. And I feel like the, the restaurateurs in Saskatchewan, if I can make a general statement, are very proud of those things and really try and showcase them in their, in their menus. 
And that really came out to me. I think I had the best pastries out of night oven, mm, you know, and yes. traveled to like New York and Ital- Italy, right? And the canals were like mm-hmm. so amazing. Um, but I agree with you, Dan. I, I remember sitting in Italy in Cinque Terre and we were enjoying this like amazing pasta and bread. And we were watching them like cut up the slices of bread. And then we see these bags of flour behind them. And it's this product of Saskatchewan. And we asked the restaurateurs about it and they're like, oh yeah this flower comes from a place i don't know where and they like totally you know butchered saskatchewan yes. as a name right? it is a hard name to say but you like, always, if you're unfamiliar <laughs> <laughs> but you always hear about how you know we have such great ingredients in canada um and there's this perception that we ship it out and then we end up buying it again and jen i'm just wondering your thoughts on that and um is there some truth to that and what can we do to support uh local economy more you're a hundred percent right, Carmen. And I actually, I wrote a, I have a, a food column. It's called Flat Out Food that runs in the Star Phoenix and the Leader Post in Saskatoon and Regina. And I wrote about that very thing today because I, I mean, it's a huge part of our of our industry and everything else. It's important, but I do find it a little silly, if I may say silly, that we export a huge amount of raw products. These ingredients, the lentils, the barley, the the wheat, everything you're talking about, and they're processed somewhere else, either in Canada or even outside of Canada, and then they're they're brought, they're imported back into Saskatchewan. The price Mm -hmm. hiked up, and that's that's for multiple reasons that I won't get into. I mean, we just don't have the processing capabilities in Mm -hmm. Saskatchewan until Protein Industries Canada came along, uh, pulse processing, Mm -hmm. but. The thing that is really cool about Saskatchewan is we've got this growing community of value-added food producers and these mark or farm-to-consumer, uh, like farm gate businesses mm-hmm. that are developing products and selling raw products right to consumers. So that's really helping build our local economy and it's getting us more in touch with everything that we grow here. Because I think a lot of people. I didn't even know how much we grew here and how much is produced here. And I've written about food here for years. <laughs> so it's really great to see all this support for it. I think with the, with the book Flat Out Delicious, you really learned to dis, yeah, to discover what really was being made in Saskatchewan, right? So the book has, how many uh, producers and artisans does it have in it? 167, and there could have been over 200. Yeah, it that's blew incredible. my mind. That's incredible. So what was the most maybe interesting or unique producer that you did discover in your own province? Oh, there's so many. One of my favorites is a man down in Neville that's in the southwest corner of the Mm -hmm. province and these are his turkeys on the front cover. So he raises heritage Narganset turkeys. They live outside all year round. They fly up in the trees and roost. They are incredibly hardy. Um, If you know anything about domesticated turkeys like that you'd find in the grocery store, Mm The brains have kind of just been bred out of them. They're very, they're really hard to raise. They're a bit dumb. You have to really prompt them to eat and drink when they're young. Not these heritage turkeys. These guys are like, they're awesome. And so he sells the turkeys and he makes turkey jerky from them, which I love turkey jerky. <laughs> but you drive into the into his farm and he's got a permaculture forest as well. So he's reforesting his area and he's got just a beautiful permaculture system of planting things together that help fix nitrogen mm-hmm. for the other and feed the turkeys but all the turkeys come out on the driveway and they start wobbling at you and it's just magical and then he throws them berries and they come running to him <laughs> <laughs> magical turkeys i love it so you this yeah. book has been quite quite the process for you you know i've i've been sort of alongside you from start to finish with the whole project. So do you want to just talk a bit about how much work it is to do a book like this? Because it's it's a bit different than a cookbook because you're not just in your home recipe testing. You're actually, you traveled across the entire province for this. Yeah, and thank you for your support, Dan. Dan was actually the one who recommended me to Touchwood Editions to write this no, book. That's not what thank I was trying to throw out there, but anyway. That's okay, I'm going to say it. You were the person um, who wrote it. You're the person that should have read it, wrote in it, pardon me, and you got that, written it. And I have the utmost respect for anyone that does a cookbook because I don't know how you do that, but this was an adventure. It started two years ago this month, actually, so I started researching and um, finding all the people that I wanted to be in the book, mm-hmm. potentially. I started asking chef friends and farmer friends who they source from, their neighbors. Mm-hmm. And I started to 
developing this database, and I ended up with over 200 people on it, which would have been too big for the book, right. which blew my mind that there were so many people in Saskatchewan that could be in this book. But then I knew I wanted to visit them in person because it's, it's Flat Out Delicious is also about regenerative agriculture mm -hmm. and sustainable growing techniques, holistic animal husbandry. So I needed to see everyone in person and see how their animals are being raised, how they're growing their vegetables, touch the dirt, and then see the chefs too, of course, mm -hmm. and who they're sourcing from. So yeah, it was about a four-month road trip. My friend Richard Marjan <laughs> and I, not all at once, but spread out. It's a casual four-month road trip. and I take those all the time. Actually, I sort of do, but yeah. anyway. <laughs> and we camped part of the way. And we just, we toured the whole province and um, Tourism Saskatchewan was incredible. Their travel media fund made the, the research possible. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just met everyone and started documenting it. And then the manuscript writing <laughs> began, which um, not the most fun thing I've ever no. done. Not as much fun as, <laughs> as touring the province, mm -hmm. but really, yeah, life-changing experience. That's great. Incredible. So now you have your digital launch on May 5th for the book. I know you probably had a, a huge line of events planned with to go along with this book because there's so much you can do with it, right? You can have farm dinners, you can do a culinary interactive events with people. So how are you approaching a book launch? You're the first person I've talked to that has actually had to launch a book during this time. So I'm curious to see how you are approaching that challenge. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to use um, the same software that you're using for this program, Dan, because yeah. oh, it, it allows me to bring on different guests mm -hmm. and they'll be... Richard is coming on, the photographer. We're going to tell some funny stories about there's an outtake section at the mm -hmm. back of the book with some of our favorite pictures and just things that happened on mm -hmm. that road trip because it was just such a unique experience. And it really tells the stories behind the people of Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. too. And then we'll bring on Chef Milton Ribello, who hilariously I forgot to put in the book. <laughs> He's one of the best chefs in Saskatchewan. Oh, no. He's a funny, chef out of Regina, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's in Regina. We'll tell that story. He's going to do a cooking demo because he's at home with his kids right now, and they're all going to get in the kitchen together. Mm -hmm. And then we have also Anna Schaub from the Garlic Garden. We grow incredible garlic in Saskatchewan, and she is the most animated, vivacious woman when it comes to talking about farming and garlic. So, yeah, it'll be a similar format to this, and we'll have lots of fun, and we can do Q&As with people, and, yeah, just spread the good food word. Yeah. Can't wait to watch it. Thank you. So, uh, Carmen, anything else you want to ask, Jen, before we say goodbye? No, I think we've taken up a lot of your time, Jen, and I just so appreciate you being on here. It's always nice to see you either virtually or even in person, and I've had the luxury of being able to meet you and talk about Saskatchewan. Your passion really radiates every time, so thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen. It's always a joy to see you, too. I'll see you in person soon. Yes, right. hopefully. Right. Thank you, Jen, and good luck with your book launch on May 5th. Thanks, I'll, I'll be tuning in. See you then. Bye. 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 Uh, I love Jen Sharp's spirit, too. She's just such an uplifting person to talk to as well. Just great energy. Yeah, she's so warm. It's wonderful to listen to. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting to have someone, you know, that is that grew up in Saskatchewan and is, still loves it so much, right, and still finds things mm -hmm. to discover about it. Because I feel like when, as we get older, we might get sort of complacent and feel like we know everything about our city or our province. And I feel like through the research for Flat Out Delicious, Jen really discovered how to love Saskatchewan more than she already did. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Anyway, I, I love Saskatchewan. I'm from there. So I know I see <laughs> I love Saskatchewan. <laughs> it is too. a great and very underrated province. So, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I agree. Right. Everybody is so freaking friendly. <laughs> yes. I know. It's true. It's You hear that a lot if you haven't been to Saskatchewan, but people there actually are extremely friendly. Yeah. I have my days, but aside from me, everyone else is pretty good. So, <laughs> All right, so next up, we have a very talented pastry chef coming on the show. So her name is Caitlin Bland, and she is a chef in Calgary. She's the pastry chef for Bridget Bar and Lulu Bar, two of the city's most buzzworthy restaurants for the past few years. And Marilyn is going to make some homemade marshmallows with her. You ready, Mar? Hello. I'm ready. All right, here we go. To virtually meet you. Hello. <laughs> nice to virtually Hello. be here in my own kitchen. <laughs> I am I'm coveting I'm on it oh my gosh you can have a, you can have a potted plant but you're going to make marshmallows and I don't know if you know this but it's like my favorite thing to make because I have coke all the time so just get the ball rolling here I'm so excited 
Perfect. Well, yeah, so I was trying to think of something that, because right now, obviously, we're trying our best to stay in our homes and to not go out. So I know with um, a lot of pastries, there are very specialty ingredients that you need to find, whether it's special flavorings or food colorings or nut flours or flour or yeast right now. I mean, those are virtually impossible to find. So I was trying to come up with something that everyone could make using ingredients that, for the most part, people have in their homes. So today we're going to be making marshmallows. Yeah, I'm cheering right now. I'm cheering for you because you were so in the moment on the page because I see all these recipes with things like A, I don't have, and B, I'm never going to be able to find. So good on you. <laughs> Show me how to make marshmallows with what I've got in my house. Okay. Yeah, so the main thing that I'm going to be using today is actually Jello, just like good old J-E-L-L-O. Um, so this will add your coloring and your flavoring to your marshmallows without needing, again, special extracts or food colorings or anything. It's just, you use some jello and you can make fun colors. And then you can make all these different spring colors. I'm going to show you how to make your own mini marshmallows today, too. Okay. So the only other ingredient that you really need that you might not have is unflavored gelatin. So just, it's in any grocery store. It's not hard to find. It's not flying off the shelves right now, like <laughs> Easter flour are. So <laughs> it's easy enough to track this stuff down. So it's pretty simple. Marshmallows are... People don't realize how easy they actually are to make. They're and they're so much better <laughs> than what it I know there's before. not all that junk in them, okay? Yeah. So you're gonna make a simple syrup, right? So you've got your simple syrup already boiling. Do you have sugar and water? That's it, right? Yes, yeah. So we've got two steps. So first of all, in my mixer, so I've got my kitchen mixer here. This is where I have bloomed the unflavored gelatin. So this is just cold water, unflavored gelatin. It sits for about five minutes. You just want to balloon that gelatin and get it ready to go. Okay, so consumer speak gloom just means bloom means that you're just sort of getting it to reabsorb the water. Okay. I'm I'm talking consumers. Okay. All right. Yeah. So you've bloomed the gelatin. All right. The gelatin, just get it to absorb some water, get it soft so it's not that dry powder anymore. And then in the pot, we've got some granulated sugar, the jello powder, corn syrup, and a little bit of water. So it's essentially a simple syrup with that little bit of jello powder in there. Genius. Genius. <laughs> and then we've just cooked it up to softball stage. So I've actually got it there already. So in order to do this, you will need a candy thermometer. Um, you can judge softball stage by dripping some of the sugar into a bowl of cold water. And if it forms a ball and it's still malleable, that's your softball stage. You're generally good to go. But I like but what's the candy temperature thermometer. that you're looking for on your candy thermometer? What, what's the temperature that you want? So we're looking for 240 degrees Fahrenheit or 115 degrees Celsius. Good. Okay. Yeah, that's your softball stage. So once you get your uh, sugar up to softball stage, so, and you're one of the tricks too. I discovered this yesterday testing this out. You want to make sure you use a pot that is much bigger than what you think you're going to need because it does about quadruple in volume. So yeah. I had a little mess on my stove yesterday afternoon. It's fine. It's fine. I can clean that. <laughs> but so then after that, all you're going to do is just pour that hot sugar. Be careful because it is 240 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes. Don't get this on your, your, your skin or you're going to be at the merge. Okay, yeah. Exactly. Oh, it's a beautiful color. Green. Oh, I love green. It's like green my Green and liney and delicious. I got that hot sizzling in my uh, <laughs> sink over there. <laughs> and then we're just going to mix it up a little bit with the whisk just to incorporate the, um, the bloom gelatin. Yeah. And then you're going to toss it on your mixer. And then you're going to throw it on high speed. I'm not going to do it right now because my mixer is very loud. <laughs> no, I have the same <laughs> one. Yeah. You throw it on high speed for about five to ten minutes right. until it's going to trickle in volume. It's going to turn really pale and fluffy. And you're going to actually hear your mixer. It's going to start to struggle. <laughs> you know, as, so as it cools, um, you're incorporating air, and then as the marshmallow cools, that gelatin solidifies and solidifies around all those little air bubbles, which makes your nice, big, fluffy, puffy marshmallow. Okay, now you're talking science, and I love it. It's one of the reasons I like baking, and you're you're a pastry chef, so I mean we know the science of ingredients, right? So yes. it's not it's like magic. All right, so now you've got it all you've all got it beaten up. Now you're going to do the reveal. I'm getting all excited. So the fun part that I love about marshmallows is that you can do so many different things with them. They don't have to be squares. So you can either 
put them into oven. I've done, so yesterday I made some cherry marshmallows. I'm going to have some cherry and some lime, and I'm going to have a little cherry and lime made marshmallow party here later. <laughs> but you can either put them into a very well greased pan of any sort. So I just did, um, I think this is a nine by nine, maybe an eight by eight. It's a pan. <laughs> Right, right, right. Put it in a grease pan so you can see how much lighter and fluffier it got. Yep. Or one of the other things I did yesterday was you can pipe it. The marshmallow is going to be soft enough that you can pipe. So I actually piped it into a whole bunch of little rows here. Oh, yeah. There we go. Hold up a little yeah. more. So yeah. I piped it into little strips. So now I've got these marshmallow strips. So what I can do with these now is I've got my bowl. I've never done that. I have never done that. I always do them either squares or I cut them out or what, but I, oh, my, my mind just went crazy. Okay, so what are you gonna do now? Now to make mini marshmallows. So I've got a strip, so I've got a bowl here. This is equal I of should. icing sugar and cornstarch. You need 50, 50, 50 icing sugar and cornstarch. Just icing sugar on its own. It does have a little bit of cornstarch in it, but it will still absorb some of the moisture from the air and over time your marshmallows will get sticky if you mix it half icing sugar half cornstarch then that keeps the outside of your marshmallows nice and dry and they won't chance to ever stick to each other with the humidity in the air not that we have that problem here in calgary but <laughs> well, i do in Toronto, but i have never done that and they do get really sticky so thank you i learned something okay so now you're going to cut them into little things and throw them in that bowl so yes. now it's just kitchen share. genius yeah. Just take a pair of scissors and I'm just going to cut tiny little, my own little homemade mini marshmallows and then just give them a little toss in the flour or cornstarch there. Yeah. Shake them off. Whoops. As I just like sploosh icing sugar all over my kitchen. <laughs> and there we go. And then you've got, let me do this in the clean hand. We've got some little mini marshmallows. Whoop, there goes one. That's one for the dog. <laughs> I... I'm in love with you, Caitlin. Oh my God, that is so, I, because I don't make my mini marshmallows like that and that's why they don't, they look like crap. Anyway, <laughs> you way better. Thank you. And you know, I think you could do this with your kids. Just don't let them near that boiling part, but you know, after they can shape it. Um, yeah, here, Coco, rock on girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and my favorite, my personal favorite thing with, to do with mini marshmallows afterwards is it, Sorry. is it rude no <laughs> i love those those squares that you make that have like the butterscotch and the peanut butter and you mix it with the mini marshmallows those are my favorite so if you made those using homemade mini marshmallows yeah. so they would just elevate it to a whole other level game changer game yeah. changer thank you so much for letting me into your kitchen and thank you for uh demystifying how to make marshmallows you are very welcome thank you for having me today you're welcome next time i'm in calgary i'm going to come visit you at the bridget bar or the lulu bar excellent be glad to have you <laughs> thanks so much bye, bye. Have a great day Again, I feel like I keep saying this when we come back from segments, but I, I, I love Caitlin Bland too. I think this show has been really fun and such good energy from the guests we're having today. It's been amazing. And next time we're in Calgary, Maryland, we'll have to do a little Eat North Variety Pack dinner at Bridget Bar. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe oh, we can oh, please, live on location. Please. Yes. Oh, that, live on location. Yes. Yeah. yes. Take That'd be awesome. And you know, I keep moving in my seat so that I think I probably don't match. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. we I know I went up, I, like, I, I had a coffee break and almost fell over because like, action. it's funny, people can't really see our setups. I guess if they look on our Instagram, you can maybe get a peek behind the scenes, but I'm mm -hmm. sitting with a little table in front of me and a small bench beside me and, and it's very hard to get out. <laughs> so, let's, anyway. Let's all do a little there. behind the scenes on Instagram stories after. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we should. So, okay, I mean, that means I have to vacuum though, so. <laughs> All right, so this means we are down to our, our last guest of the show. If you've watched Eat North Variety Pack before, you know that we, we love musicians and we love ending the show with a song and a fun interview. So Carmen's in the chat. And with... I have to go. Okay, okay. I have to go because my husband and I are sharing a brain and a computer okay. and he's taking an online course. So I got to go. Okay. So um, adieu to I'll, I'll watch in the replay. So thanks, everybody. Have a great week and I'll see you next week. All right. Bye, Mayor. Bye. And then, bye. so now... Carmen, you're going to chat with Juliana, so I'll Juli take it from here. Hi, Juliana. How are you? It's nice to meet you. Good. Hi, Carmen. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. I, so I have to admit, I looked up your Instagram before this episode. <laughs> I looked up your Spotify, and I noticed on Spotify you show up on your uh, Spotify playlist called Bedroom Pop. 
what yeah. is, what is yeah. bedroom pop? <laughs> yeah, um, I would love to talk about that. That's a great question. Um, so bedroom pop is just starting to gain popularity in Canada. Um, and it sort of originated from a DIY approach to recording and production. And basically, it's popular amongst artists for two reasons. Um, one is because it offers affordable recordings. And the second one is that it gives artists like full creative control over their music because they essentially produce the whole track themselves from start to finish. So you're producing in your bedroom? Is that why it's called bedroom? That, that is the reason, yes. <laughs> this is one of the studios. This is the mic I use right here. Um, <laughs> and then my friend, I work with my friend Ethan Burke too, and he has a similar setup in his bedroom. So, <laughs> oh, well, that probably made it um, a bit easier around, you know, being able to produce your music during these times where it's harder to be around other folks and be around, um, you know, in a studio setup. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Exactly. It's, um, yeah, no, it's great. It also, like, just offers, like, a space to have that creative control and, you know, experiment a bit. There's, like, no pressure of, being on the clock in the studio either, which I really like. Mm, so I see that you used to be a country singer, is that right? And it says on here you're a finalist for Project Wild 2018. Um, so how have country music and those pieces influenced the music that you're playing right now? Yeah, um, so I did grow up playing country music and listening to country music. I love it still. Um, and I think the influence that country music has on my current music mainly comes from the way that I'm writing my songs and the lyrics. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like country music, the lyrics are always so great and they tell mm -hmm. such a strong story. Um, and I think that's why a lot of people really connect with it. So just taking that same like songwriting approach mm -hmm. and just moving it more into the bedroom pop genre. Yeah. And tell us about the song that you're about to play. Yeah, so this song is called 18. Um, I wrote it a few months ago. And it's sort of just about looking back and thinking or wishing you could be as carefree as you were when you were 18. Um, I actually have a younger sister. And it's funny because when I was writing this song, I didn't have anybody in mind when I was writing it. But now that I'm looking back at it, I'm like, actually, this is sort of like my song to her. Um, she's 16 right now, but it's just sort of about keeping that like dreaming and like innocence that maybe we lose a little bit as we get older. Yeah. Um, so it's a special song to me. It's also like a feel good song, um, which I think is important right now. We need some positivity. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll be perfect to even end this episode on. So take it away, Juliana Lee. I'll, I'm just going to move back a little bit. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, we messed up a lot, but I'm proud of. 
you in your ripped up jeans My favorite tea, we had to be The coolest on the street Oh, how the time sure flies We've lost our minds But to me you will always be 18 That was awesome. awesome. Julie and Elaine, everybody. I, I love ending the show with music. It just ends it on a really good note. And uh, so much of what we do with Eat North, uh, through our events, we do try and support Canadian musicians as much as possible. So, Juliana, it's amazing to have you on today. And, and that single, 18, is available everywhere and anywhere. So download it, stream it, give it some love. It's a really great song. Oh, thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So now it looks like it's sunny outside, so maybe we should say goodbye and go catch some rays. So thank you everyone for tuning in to the sixth episode of the Eat North Variety Pack. I'm Dan Clapson. Thank you, Carmen Chang, this way, Carmen Chang and Juliana Lane for being on today. And we'll see you guys all next week. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.